Did you know that the way that we receive sounds are through these amazing waves of energy that we call vibrations? Just about everything makes vibrations, with much smaller, high-pitched sounds coming from fast vibrations, like a bee's wings buzzing. And much deeper sounds come from lower, longer vibrations, like a drum beating. Creatures who can master these sound waves prove to be incredibly resilient and dangerous, which is exactly what we are discussing today. Today's Pokemon have the powerful ability of sound manipulation to control its environment and completely overwhelm its enemies. Today I present to you the Seismitoad line. Welcome back trainers to this three-part special, Amazing Amphibians, Warriors of Nature. If this is your first time here, why not like and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below and tell us which kind of amphibian you think is the coolest. And if you really like this video, I have a whole playlist of amazing Pokemon inspired by even more amazing animals. Go check it out. Here's a question for you. Have you ever felt the ground shake? Perhaps you've been in an earthquake before. Or perhaps a large truck passed by your street and made your house shake and rattle a little bit. These are all examples of a special phenomenon known as seismic activity. Seismic activity is the event whenever strong vibrations cause the ground to move and affect things above ground, such as houses and people. If you're ever walking by a construction zone, you may feel a little bit of seismic activity as things are being built or destroyed. However, you should never walk into a construction zone, it is not safe. This line of Pokemon has the unique ability to control incredibly powerful vibrations from their body and to conduct a wide scale of seismic activity. We'll begin this Pokemon line with the first stage, Temple. Temple's names comes from the words timpani and timpanum, which are both types of drums. Its name also references the tympanic membranes, or the eardrum. If you look at Temple's heads, these blue nodes on their cheeks are what allow them to manipulate vibrations, which we discussed is one of their main factors in seismic activity. A really cool design note are that these cheek bumps also resemble headphones, really useful devices that allow us to hear multiple vibrations at once, mainly for music. And speaking of music, you might notice that Temple's eyebrows actually resemble musical notes. How cool is that? In amphibian biology, rather than starting as babies, these semi-aquatic creatures begin their lives as eggs, before spouting tails and becoming tadpoles. Tadpoles being where we get the pole part of Tenpole's name. I mentioned in my previous Krogunk video that the Krogunk line and this line are actually related, and I believe that there is a common connection that begins somewhere, but I'll explain this a little bit later. For now, let's discuss what happens when Tempole decides that it wants to explore its life outside of the water. This little tail isn't enough to take on the rough dirt roads, but with a little time, strength, and evolution, Tempole grows and takes on a new form as Palpitoad. With its sudden growth, Palpitoad gains the ability to walk on land thanks to its newly acquired feet. This process mirrors actual frogs and toads as they begin their lives as tadpoles, growing pieces of their body before becoming fully-fledged amphibians. This is what's known as the tricky middle stage of a toad's life, but it's actually a huge advantage for Palpitoad. Previously, Temple would use its nodes to vibrate in a nearby area, however, the activity wouldn't really be called seismic. Palpitoad now has more nodes on its body, which is actually true of real-life toads, as they now have these parotoad glands on their body, commonly referred to as warts. However, their purposes here are very similar to loudspeaker drivers, as they vibrate and shake the area around them with their cries and their croaking, similar to male toads and frogs that croak very loudly to attract mates. It's a bit ironic that their cries are more destructive and repelling, when in real life they're made to attract. It's not too much of an issue though, as they can still learn moves like Hyper Voice and Attract, so I think they're still pretty well covered. Speaking of moves, you may notice that Palpito learns more ground type moves like Bulldoze and Mudshot, which is most likely due to their extended time on land and their greater mastery of their seismic powers. You may also notice that this line is capable of learning a few poison type moves, which is something you might want to keep in mind later on. This stage of growth is also reflected of real toads and their middle growth stage, where they start spending more time in shallow waters, using muddy puddles and areas where they can take in more oxygen and begin to use their legs a bit more to build up some strength while their body continues to grow. 
there's actually one other Pokemon line, as of now, that shares this exact same growth cycle. The Poliwhirl line has a very similar evolution cycle to this line, as they both begin at tadpole-like stages and can both end up with final frog-like stages. Most if not all frog-like creatures will follow this growth, and it will always be an amazing process to watch unfold. And if you enjoyed this content, consider liking this video and leaving a comment, as well as subscribing and following on social media. And if you want to see more from the Ranger Base, follow us on Twitch where we stream art, video games, and discuss Pokemon Origins on a regular basis. I'm so glad to have you all here, and every bit of engagement helps this channel grow. Over a course of time, Palpatoad will finish its growing process, becoming much more like a real toad. From its tadpole state, to its half-complete middle stage with legs and a tail, eventually shedding that tail, crawling out from the water, and doubling in size, the toad finally arrives. Seismitoad is nearly three times larger than its previous forms, and has the most real-world influences out of its previous forms overall. Its body has the most toad-like attributes, from its head shape, web footing, Apparently the creators knew that they already had a strong Toad line Pokemon with the Poliwag line, however, they wanted this one to be more traditional with its design, taking heavy inspiration from the common Japanese Toad. Of course, Seismitoad's nodes on its body have grown so much bigger, really resembling speaker drivers. But, what I think is really amazing is how well the idea of Toads and high frequency sounds go together. The cries of the Seismitoad line are so amazing due to the fact that they resemble a speaker going through different levels of decibels, which are all needed to create stronger seismic activities. Take a listen. And all of this is even more amazing when you hear what an actual toad sounds like. Isn't that so cool? Now, in my previous video, I explained how this Pokemon line and the Krogunk line have a connection, and I believe this is the perfect place to explain it here. Earlier in this video, I explained how most amphibians go through a growth process, starting from eggs to tadpoles, eventually growing legs and a tail, before growing into fully formed frogs or toads. While the Palpitoad line completely embodies this process, Krogunk simply starts in its fully grown form. And in that video, we explained how they were really based off of the Poison Dart Frog. But, both design-wise and inspired by the real world once again, Poison creates a very interesting connection. Now you may notice that while Seismitoad does have a large jaw, and while it can't be seen from here, they do indeed have long tongues. They don't, however, have a large mouth pouch that expands like Krogunk or Toxicroak. And that's because the nodes on their head and all over their bodies can not only vibrate, but can produce some mild paralyzing liquids. I mentioned a bit earlier that in-game, this line learns a few potent poison-type moves, something that's a bit odd for something that spends a lot of time in the water and on ground. Until you realize that real-world toads have been known to produce some mild toxins from their body that can make a human and other animals sick or hallucinate when they come in contact with it. It's much weaker than that of the toxins of the poison dart frog, but it's still a common factor that helps with this whole connection. Another important note is that with Seismitoad's typing, it now gets a 4 times weakness to grass types, meaning that the grass starter of Generation 5, Superior, would easily be able to take down this behemoth of a toad. This is a parallel to the real world, where amphibians tend to share natural predators in snakes. While not their main predator, snakes have been known to devour frogs and toads on very frequent occasions, and since they don't have teeth or claws, there's very little for them to fight back with. Now let's compare these two Pokemon's designs. If we look at Seismitoad, we can notice that it does share some resemblance to Krogunk and Toxicroak, mainly within the face and eye area. The most important connecting factor is this poison sack. If you remember from the Krogunk video, both it and Toxicroak will croak very loudly, stirring up the toxins that they make in their poison jaw sacks to make them more volatile and stronger. Seismitoad doesn't seem to have that ability, however, it can vibrate any of the nodes on its body to cause quakes, which is a big change to the body structure, but explains why its body is so much larger. Let's also take a look at their environments. 
Krogonk is known to live in swamps and marshes, most famously the Great Marsh of Sinnoh. A place with less access to ponds and rivers, instead giving more muddy puddles and shallow waters, not really allowing a young amphibian room to swim. Explaining why its body would be smaller and more compact, and that its poisons would stem from the food it has access to, more than likely being toxic plants and bugs. Seismitoad, on the other hand, lives in longer lakes and rivers of clean water, really swimming much more and allowing its body to grow over a longer span of time, and really becoming a full-fledged water type. Also, if we were to assume that these two lines share a common starting form, let's say a similar tadpole state, the fact that Krogunk goes into its full form so quickly most likely has to do with the fact that marshes have much less oxygen in their water. If you didn't know, marshes are places where water has covered the ground for a long period of time, and in some places are where the sea meets the wetlands. So a lot of mixed nutrients will be here, and a lot of things that live here are extremely diverse, but only the toughest of the tough can survive out here. On a slight detour, marshes and other wetlands are extremely important to our ecosystem and should be protected at all costs. However, due to people clearing out forests and poor care, we lose so many of these wetlands, about a football field's worth a day. You know, I do have a video idea going more in depth about wetlands, as well as Pokemon and how important these things are. Let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in a video like this. Because of the rough environments of marshes, Krogonk definitely had to grow a lot tougher. However, Seismitoad definitely had a much easier growth cycle, getting a lot of clean nutrients from fresh water. This is a great example on how two similar species can change so drastically due to their environments, something that happens very frequently in our own world. However, what about our third amphibian of the series? I absolutely believe that this third line is connected to the previous ones, with the main change being what happens when an amphibian is kept in captivity. Our final dangerous amphibian is the Grid Ninja line. Do you guys like the Seismitoad line? Because I know I do. And who do you think's tougher, Seismitoad or Krogonk? Leave your comments below. And as always, keep exploring, trainers.